I know. Well, I, I, I started a little early to make sure we didn't miss it because, you know, every, they say 30 seconds, but they never mean 30 seconds. Um, I don't think Julie has a camera because she's there like she wants to join, but we're not having her come through yet. Yeah, it's kind of pulsating there. I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's uh, <laughs> camera or not. Let me get some stuff out of the way. All right. Um, well, since we want to keep it to 30 minutes anyway, let's uh, – Let's jump for you first. Since you come in with a hot topic already, go ahead. Well, there are two of them. One is Booking.com, um, jumping into TripAdvisor's Instant Booking, which uh, is uh, interesting for the hotel. I mean, certainly I think TripAdvisor investors are quite happy since last I checked the shares were up like 22 23%. Um, Priceline shares were actually down a little bit, a couple points. But the interesting one was Expedia was down about twice as much. They were down about 4%. So. Um, that will be an interesting thing to see if Expedia gets kind of pulled along or, um, but I've got to think this puts pressure on um, Starwood, Hilton, and some of the others if, you know, Marriott and, uh, and Hyatt, especially at their next earnings calls, if they come in and start saying, yeah, it's great. And I'd imagine it would be, uh, they might not say it's great, but they might say it's working, it's good, we like it because they know the terms and it's it's really something that they uh, that they knew about going into so if that's good the questions for hilton and starwood about well why aren't you in there are going to be pretty uh pretty interesting so <laughs> and it's, that's hard for wall street to accept why are you letting those you're just letting those guys have that share of the market and uh, yeah, you know, booking.com seemed to think it was good why are you left out so yeah no you know that if as one goes all will go it's just a matter of how soon they're going to make the transition over to it Kind of goes back to one of our early conversations where we're talking about isolating out the uh, the audiences that are related to the within the day booking, uh, yeah. in the proximity booking, like the Facebook. Uh, there, when we talked about, it, I think three or four sessions ago, I think where uh, the discussion was, Facebook now allows you to identify an address not your own, and from that you can also determine the audience you want to speak to, whether it's within the radius of that address, outside the radius of that address, but less than 100 miles, or outside of 100 miles so you could actually say travelers that are your competitor uh and we've done some work with that it's, it's interesting there's there's a give and take as to how successful that localized identifier is but again to your point the day booking we're once again tra training people oh don't worry about a reservation uh or make one but know that it's still up for question uh the day that you arrive because uh heck you can go over and see what else people are offering yeah. you while you're play the tables right which is is really kind of the uh i mean not necessarily day of booking but that was the whole price line hotwire pitch was hey you can go stay where you want or would you rather roll the dice and if you want to save 15 percent, 30 percent, something is it worth rolling the dice and uh certainly a lot that, of people what was that app that do. uh uh they had for a while that if you had a reservation you could sell it Oh, it's still yeah, it's still there. It's um oh, what is it? Um, I can't remember, that, but it still exists. Um, and certainly TripBam is doing that in the uh, in the corporate space. I mean, and TripBam's kind of looking at it in the corporate area as a tool for agencies to really go in and just kind of double check the reservations and say, hey, this is still the lowest price at that particular property or at a competing property to to kind of flip a flip down and just you know more optimization you know more transparency of rates more more technology behind it so yeah yeah it's it's an interesting corner because at that point from a revenue manager's point of view um how can i just for do i do i have to keep my rate integrity even within the day for the day or it, does that give me the value add prop proposition of saying hey let me go over and bail on daily rate uh, for the last pickup, and how do I keep people that are already booked uh, putting money back on the table uh, because I offered them a better than what they got rate? Right? Yeah, yeah, and well, and I think in terms of TripAdvisor in particular, now that you have so many different channels, because you've you've still got the pay per click channel, right, where you can go bid on that. You've got instant booking. You've got your business listing with your little. You can do a little coupon up at the top. So even for an individual hotel, can have three different channels at play. On that same, you know, on that same page, all different factors coming in, and most of the revenue management systems aren't really set up for that. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, there's a channel over there, and that's what we're selling. But oh, all of a sudden, am I competing with myself? Or since I'm only getting part of the traffic from what I've bid on instant booking, 
what else is out there, right? And you've got everybody else in the meta area and and whoever may be getting the 50% or 75% share of the uh, of the instant book views, you got those to do too. So, yeah. so. Well, question of this remember in the old revenue management days, you used to calculate or keep track of unconstrained demand. Yeah. Yep. And we don't do that as much anymore because it was a non-definable way of determining our success because, well, unconstrained demand. But if when we're tossing this around internally on, on a project, uh, PKF did this study about Airbnb. And what they did was they were able to aggregate all of the inventory by market uh, that was being offered by Airbnb in a market. And right. then they designated a filter on it that was, was it is it truly competitive inventory? Like, is it... Uh, it's not a couch or a tree house or the back of somebody's car, but rather a, an isolated room or a house with multiple rooms or whatever. And yep. they, they put that filter in. They even put a filter in that said, hey, if, if nobody's reviewed it in six weeks, that's a dormant inventory because they're not active in the market. So take that out. But what they were left with was a competitive set for an area that hotels just don't assign themselves. They don't look at it and say, wow, you know, this is an inventory that I'm competing against. And I don't know if PKF went one step farther and they just didn't share it, but wonder if you were to pull rate availability on that inventory that you've isolated and oh, compare absolutely. that to your rate strategy for your hotel. Now, all of a sudden, you're looking at, again, dare I say, somebody that's answering the unconstrained demand perspective, which is right. this is demand that you didn't even know was in your market because it's being satisfied by inventory you're not tracking. It just right. it brings up an interesting question. I know we're tangent off on the revenue management side of things to, so far, but... Yeah. It's one of those things that these things are factors that affect what you're saying, last day availability, rate availability for the last day, inventory availability going into market, research rate availability in market. Yep. You know, it all begins to get connected in some pretty interesting ways. Right. And, and at least the stats that I've seen out of the PKF report and some of the others that, um, yeah, you're looking at 9% of the available rooms in New York are Airbnb or some sort of, you know, gig economy type, you know, <laughs> type uh, product. And they're saying as much as 4% of the occupancy could be. I mean, which yeah, is but so. But then what if you were to add a vacation oh, model? Oh, trust me, Air, Airbnb is tracking it. And that's oh, the key, yeah. right? Because the, the understanding of the unconstrained demand, Airbnb has that information. TripAdvisor has that information. Booking.com have that information. But when you're just kind of on the recipient end of, of this stuff, you don't. And yeah, you know, and that's that's tricky for the hotels. Yeah, and that changes the strategy aspect too. That if you're not, if you don't even assess your competitors to know how you should be competing with them in the space, you're not even looking at them as a comp set for your marketing strategy. That you're not saying what is Airbnb doing in my space at my rate tier at my inventory type. You're simply saying, if anybody was just looking at hotels, how do I position myself into market presence from a strategic point of view? You're only looking at part of your competitive set. So it, it literally can change your marketing strategy by not knowing of, about this inventory that we're not accounting for. So right. I just, well, and, and Airbnb is giving pricing tools to the hosts to optimize their pricing. So they know, hey, I'm way too expensive. I need to get the price down, what prices move. And again, that it's really smart. I mean, Expedia has been doing that for, for years, decades, right? In terms of providing business intelligence for the hotels so they can use the platform more effectively. Yeah. And, and yeah, same with booking.com. I mean, that's what a, a good, smart intermediary does. And uh, yeah, it's, it's good information that they have. Now, the stats, again, I hear on Airbnb are generally it's somewhere 30 to 40 percent less than a traditional hotel right and again new york really skews it because you don't have a lot of one and two star or traditional one and two star product and things like that but the reality is these are individuals um it's not something like uber where uber's setting the market pricing and surge pricing they're they are letting the you know letting the hosts set their own price and they aren't sitting there trying to work 70 percent 90 percent occupancy they're sitting there going you know, if they're at 50% or 40%, 30%, running it once a month, who cares? It's more money than nothing and to get it in. You know, the same thing in the um, global financial meltdown. You had these large hotels, you know, some owners going, any price, <laughs> anything over a variable cost, take it in. We're going to take those pennies and put them toward the mortgage. So. Sounds matter of factual, but PKF also showed a, a skewed data where they correlated the occupancy demand, you know, the higher density occupancy requirements by market. And then the amount of inventory available uh, by Airbnb in those markets. And, of course, it's a correlation that's profound. I mean, New York, Los Angeles, you can literally watch down the arc curve 
every major high demand occupancy market had an equally high level of inventory associated with Airbnb. So Absolutely. it's following the market demand. And even if you're thinking that it's not a direct competitor of yours, if your market has the demand that you're calculating against, there are people with an Airbnb that see an opportunity that they're adding inventory to. So right. I know and if they can under and if they can undercut a price. And that's the thing where you have now this flexible demand where what during the Olympics and you know FIFA World Cup, things like this. Yeah, you'd wind up having cruise ships pull up, right? And then here are 500 rooms of inventory. That's where, well, this is really dynamic. And you look for the, the World Cup, the Pope's visit, things like that, where normally, traditionally, hotels would be rubbing their hands together. Going, ah, here we go. All of a sudden, that peak isn't quite as high. You know, it com it's coming down a little bit because there's more supply. There's some price points. And that's, that's a challenge for the hoteliers. I'm throwing it out there to anybody else that's sitting around with us. We went off on this revenue management talk about right. last minute bookings and we kind of tangent that probably excludes some other ideas. I, I want to throw, not that this isn't awesome and we can probably bounce back into it easily, uh, but also just other things that, um, two things I want to bring up. We we did a blab for HSMEI for presenting to the chapters, which Robert, you were great, gracious enough to be a part of as a backup and conversationalist and topic person. We ended up having enough people, so we didn't have to, we ran out of chairs, but um, the, I, I, I was the closer and you know the it was over you know you're over three runs ahead I didn't have to come in that's right you didn't have to you didn't you just had to say hey all right I'm there if you need me um, but we did bring up uh, concerns and conversations from our digital council retreat for HSMEI that was about what to be looking at for 2016 it was a fun conversation but the one that was the prevalent topic was personalization I mean we've gone through iterations of this over the past few years the Salomo the social local mobile which is really just an acronymic way of saying now that we're talking to people on alternate platforms and knowing their location, what's the tool they're using? So Lomo, you know, so it's a social, local, and mobile. But now it's about defining the conversation because we know they're on mobile. Uh, just coming back from the land of Google, they made a statement that was very succinct. They said mobile isn't a subset of the Internet. It is the Internet. Yeah. And because of that, identifying mobile as a alternate strategy is not acknowledging its size. I mean, Google just announced also they are getting more searches on mobile than they are on any other platform. So everything is through this, this, this smaller medium to it. With that said, what gets showing on the screen has a huge impact now on success for us. And Google just announced that they're launching their new Maps search results. And lo and behold, they went from seven local results down to three. So now there's even less opportunity to show up constructively for your local results. And they and remember that whole conversation we had, uh, again, two, three sessions ago, uh, about how Google is doing their assisted booking, where they're helping people through their hotel finder? Well, this impacts hotel finder as well. They're offering more robust content for their top three tiers results, which happen to coincidentally go with the ones that they're featuring that you're paying for, um, to give you more of an opportunity to purchase via the data that they're giving. It was also a fun point they made that most people use Google Maps, not necessarily for directions, but for the information they need. Is the store still open? Uh, right. The restaurant, what's the menu? They're using it more as a conduit for content than they are so much about the direction function of the map itself which I thought was a very interesting way of looking at from a strategic point of view, from marketing wise, um, you're looking at, to your point, same day possible change of booking. Well, they're going to use the medium of the map, what's around them, what, what is a value to them. And now Google is mitigating it, that conversation even more by removing the, the, the amount of results they're getting because the screen size potentially is the catalyst and giving you more information about those three options that they're highlighting. Right. And and they're doing you know, you had at, at one point the carousel at the top of the screen, right, where you had all the different kind of semantic search criteria and the whole, you know, the whole knowledge center from Google that's being worked into it. So, yes, part of it is who's paying for the for the positions, but also it's what's likely most relevant to people. And all of a sudden, once they start looking at here's what you've been searching for. Oh, you're tapped into to Gmail and they see here are the types of hotels you you stay in and where you're traveling and things like that. All of a sudden, it wind yeah you know, they're tied into your calendar, um, which that integration is going to you know I think it's now live and, and coming through. So you start tying that stuff together, knowing here's where appointments are, here what they generally. Hey, 
you know, how's how's this particular hotel? You go, oh, wow, that, hey, that looks great. Oh, and it's got a great price. Wow, what do, what do you know? I got to do this. And uh, yeah, it's it's powerful. And again, Google was very smart. They combined local, they moved local onto the Maps platform. They moved, you know, Google Plus, everything got integrated, integrated together so they didn't have these little siloed functions. And yeah, now all of a sudden you can, you, you really have some very relevant, meaningful, meaningful stuff. And again, they have this vast amount of business intelligence on these individuals, let alone the unique advertiser ID that can go track you wherever you may be going. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, um, it's really, really powerful stuff. It is. It is. I, I, I feel bad because you know how you the names that uh, somebody can tell you the name over and over and you can never remember it. Well, there's an app that uh, what it does is it places uh, your OTA comparison on your own website. And uh, it shows what the Expedia and what else is showing, of course, mitigating it compared to your offer rate. So you're doing your own service to your own site. The, the fun part of that is, is that it actually improves conversions for your site because it authenticates right. the channel uh, yep. pricing. Board. Of course, they say 4% of the actual traffic gets lost to them. Um, but it does give you the chance then uh, from an information background to see who went to them and what rates were showing compared to yours if you lost them because of rate or whatever have you. Right. And, and people are, uh, it, it harkens back to the time, uh, I think the first time I ever made USA Today was I had placed TripAdvisor's uh, uncensored comments on my hotel websites. And the owners freaked. They're like, Lauren, you, yeah. you made me spend all this money to advertise these websites. And then you're showing what people are saying about us. And if it's not a good thing that they're saying about us, I'm paying people to see that. And I'm like, right. it's how we handle that dialogue. And now that, that conversation obviously has played out where, you know, it's just as much how you handle the dialogue as it is the dialogue itself. But it, it, it harkens to that, like, why would I ever go over and put a third party's rates on my own website when I'm trying to get them to book? It authenticates the relationship. Well, yeah, I call that it's the validation stage, which happens right before booking. And I've, I've been a strong proponent of the seven stages of, of the travel process since like for a decade. Right. And it started out with three stages it was like shop, check, book, which was really kind of the GDS approach. And that was kind of Travelocity and yeah, because it was Sabre, you know, Sabre based and Expedia kind of started with that. But around 2004, I, I kind of the, and by that time, folks were kind of talking about maybe moving from three to five, but there were seven. And so you start off, there's inspiration. Then there's some research of just like, well, I want to go. You know, I always use Honeymoon Market as a classic example. Hey, let's go to the Seychelles. And they don't know where the Seychelles are. They hear it's great. Though. And then all of a sudden, you know, the, so the research, they start figuring out. Then the planning, which is how much money do I have? How much time? What are the flights? All that stuff. And then right after that, there's this validation stage, which is where TripAdvisor plays. And why Booking.com and Marriott and all those guys are working with them is because people are, they want to go check that review and go, do I see anything that says dirty or bed bugs or mean staff or whatever right there? Yep. That's good. And I mean, that is a linchpin for somebody sees something bad or negative and it's like, eh, maybe not. Let's go back to, you know, backtrack to the planning research stage that didn't, you know, this little you know strand didn't thread didn't work out, but then you go to booking. And it's right, it's right there. So it's a powerful, it's yeah. a powerful, powerful spot. But, but I don't know if we're we're intimidating people that are following us along. I don't know whether Paolo just joined to be nice and he's watching to see how we play out our conversation or what. But I don't know whether we're scaring by topic or not. But we haven't had anybody try to join us except for Julie. So I'm opening it up to anybody that's listening to you. If they would like to join, you're more than welcome. It's not uh, just for back and forth for us to chat. Whoop, Julie's going to try it again. Uh, hopefully Julie can come through. Oh, hey. there she is. Hey. It worked. Hey, Julie. I had to give my browser permission. To ah. ah. Hi, Julie. I really nice. don't have anything to add. The topic is way over my head, but I just wanted to validate that I'm here and listening, and you guys are doing a great job. Ah. Well, I, I, I've, got, I've got another piece of news, though, which I do want to – I thought it was very interesting that you had the same day that Booking.com goes on to TripAdvisor, Amazon – shutters their their destinations thing so amazon again is out of the travel business so for now, for for now. now well yeah how many times have they been in it <laughs> how many times have they been in it for over a year yeah, but, yeah i mean this one it was you know it's kind of a six month type thing and uh 
and they're gone again, which uh, is amazing. So Expedia, who just did the uh, you know the Orbitz deal, must be like, thank you, Amazon, for coming in there and saying, yeah, look at all this company. Look at Amazon. There's Google. There's all this. Whoop, no more Amazon. Hey, Bethany. Hey, <laughs> No, it's nice. We actually have four squares now. Rather than it just be Robert and I chatting back and forth, like, I don't know. What do you think? I don't know. What do you think? It's just like internal <laughs> voices the whole time for the process. That's but. Right. I would no. be surprised if Amazon tries to get back into the travel. They they really like waiting to see other websites do things well. Like uh, right now, their big battle is they just started a handmade website. Oh, yeah. Etsy, Etsy. Is take them on Etsy. Yep. So travel agency currently uh, travel is currently off the hook, but handmade shops are are being yeah. treated by the Amazon giant. Yeah, it, I think it really for them is it's focus, right? I mean, it's just they, they probably could. I would think they would be really good at it, but I think they just look at here are margins. It's different, and let's you know just focus over at the you know all these other opportunities they have to go. Uh, funny, funny, funny thought to that though. If you think about an earlier conversation we had when we were talking about Apple uh, TV and that Airbnb was one of the first apps is being offered on on Apple TV, you know yeah. how. Interesting would be that Amazon, with the method of payment in place, product disbursement in place, a history of having been in this space before, just decided to say, let's give up this battle, but let's find another one that we can win, and enters into another channel like that, where all of a sudden now you're in the Amazon experience on an interface like an Apple TV or, or the next iteration of Chromecast, and it's a product variable to, let's discover Portland, and then from there, it's yep. like, here's all these things that you can buy via Amazon with the methodology already in place. Yeah. I mean, they might just say- They'll have some micro brew beer shipped to you and you don't even have to go there, get ready. Yeah, I, it's unbelievable. But they they never captured the intellectual property from all their other forays. I mean, they, they partnered with Overstock at one point. It was all Overstock stuff. They, Amazon was just kind of the conduit for the for the traffic and, and an affiliate. Um, basically, um, same thing with Expedia, right? Actually, that one went on for a couple of years, but Expedia got all, really kind of all the benefit. But all of that power that um, that Amazon has in terms of their recommendation engines and you know that collaborative filtering platform is is amazing. And we have boy, could really play well in travel. We have to give Bethany credit on a great idea. She watched another Blabcast from uh, SEM Rush that they took the transcript was it Bethany and then used yeah. it. They basically uh, shared, since you record all your blogcasts, they, they took the video recording, but then for SEO value, they also put up the entire transcript. Uh -huh. uh, so everything they said in the blab was crawlable by search engines. And not to mention oh. all the, the newsworthiness of blab still being a pretty new platform, um, uh -huh. getting some good search volume and traffic out of that. So I guess we we'll we'll actually have... start sharing his blabs like that, <laughs> and put them up on a blog, put the transcript. We have to do that for the HSMI stuff, perhaps, that we take, because they're all recorded, and we move them over just as current content, and then we can also take the content uh, transcript and right. throw it up there as well as a, as a part of that, too. But we, I guess we should also, in an inadvertent way, thank the young lady who decided to periscope her drunk driving in Lakeland last night, or the day nice. before today. They put periscope on the map as a live tool. People didn't really were aware of periscope or Meerkat as much as we probably think they would. <laughs> and here the the, the police found her very, very, by looking at the live broadcast and seeing where she was driving by and actually caught her before she heard anybody. So, I mean, just, what, first off, what a weird usage of live broadcasting. <laughs> and two, why would you even mentally do it? But thankfully she was, she at least did that and there was somebody smart that called the police and the police had somebody smart that looked and downloaded the app and was watching her and found out where she was and stopped before she heard anybody. But. I guess Periscope should maybe pay for their, their legal counsel or something because it probably put it on a national scale that they hadn't had before. So, well, right. yeah, I I could have done the blab off of my off of my mobile driving in the car about thirty five minutes ago, but I thought better of it. Now, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think there'd be a bad thing. It's like I, I think nowadays we always ask people when you call or you text somebody's like, "Hey, is now a good time?" or "Am I catching you driving?" Because we don't want to just force them into driving and talking or something. But, yeah. Um, Topic-wise, anything else that we wanted to hit for this week that was a standoff for anybody? I know T News had a couple of pop-ups of where they said that the uh, travel industry has not quite learned the, the customer journey as well as we take credit for yet. Uh, they're saying that we're still trying to monetize our relationship faster than we are trying to create one. I thought that was an interesting statement for them to make that uh, we kind of like listen until we can see when we can sell something is the gist of it rather than listening and then seeing how we can help 
and eventually sell something. It was just a, a kind of an eagerness on our part to act like we were interested in somebody just to get to what we want. So I don't know. It's just I thought it was an interesting article that Team News popped up because we kind of it's almost turned into for the fact that we're talking about the conference and agenda for the digital marketing conference for HSMI next year in February on the 17th that we already have done the customer journey story. We've talked about it in a way for people to understand it. And here we are thinking that that's old terrain when in fact no. we're saying we didn't really learn the lesson. So Well, and all the personalization, if you misinterpret your relationship with that customer and all of a sudden it's, hey, you're chummy and that's great, that can be really bad. And it's just like regular relationships with people. Yeah, uh, I don't know, maybe for HSMAI we should, we should frame it in terms of dating like first dates or something. Because <laughs> let me tell you, the hotels are sitting there going, hey, let's go to dinner. It's the blind date, and it's just barrage with deals and offers. And yeah. <laughs> and stuff people don't want to hear, right? <laughs> I just realized my office light went out because it's motion sensitive. Hold on. Uh -oh. well, right I was going to say why I hopped in was just the idea of as Amazon's getting out of travel, um, Pinterest, I feel like it's been having a renewed interest in just local search and travel and the hospitality mm -hmm. industry in general. It's, it's something that I think a lot of hotels maybe shifted social media focus to to Facebook or Twitter. Um, but I feel like Pinterest has quietly been redoing a lot of their boards with with their moves into buyable pins. They got some e-commerce attention, but yeah. they're doing a lot more with their places boards now and, and oh, uh, just kind of their their ability to almost be a search engine has kind of increased and, and made it so they it's more of a travel awareness. They, they want people, they want travelers to go to Pinterest more. Yeah, uh, it's great digital bookmarking or visual bookmarking, right? So if you can go to a board and you go, wow, look at all this beautiful stuff for this place. Is, um, still the, the best one that I've seen is Four Seasons Pin Pack Go um, promotion. I think, I think I've talked to, to Lauren about it. I don't know if you guys are aware of that, but they, they use it as a concierge tool and you go put together your little board and your pins. And you go, this is the kind of stuff that I'd like to do. And the concierges or whoever's handling it on the social media team puts together really highly customized trip based on what you'd like. And the best example I saw was a woman who, um, it was kind of the last trip with her husband before she was having a baby going to Austin in the dead of summer. And it was great. And she said she wanted, you know, music and food and, you know, kind of ventures. And they put together, you know, here's a film festival so you don't have to be going around. Here's a great walk around, you know, Town Lake. Here, you know, all these different things, um, you know, live music venues or a place to go dancing. And not once did they really push their own restaurant. You know, they, they gave recommendation for some Iron Chef, you know, based restaurant. Another one was like this great upscale barbecue um, barbecue place, but at no point like pummeled them with here's our deal. Yeah, you know, we'll give you a deal on dinner or something like that. Nothing but the woman wound up booking an extensive dinner like at, you know, whatever, 530 at night before they went out someplace else. It was it was fantastic. Mm -hmm. Oh, Joe's jumped off to see if Jay can jump in. So we'll see if Jay wants to join us. Uh, thanks, Julie. Just give us a space for them to sit on. Hey, um, there was something interesting, too. Somebody was using Vine. Uh, I came across them because I was looking for repair stuff, but I thought a quick, fun variation to it was they, uh, Lowe's used it for Fix It in Six, which was Vine with Six Second Video. They did a Fix It uh, series for six, six Seconds. And um, instead, I thought would we kind of do something like a Trip in Six, like do a six second quick, what can you do to show in six seconds why people want to travel to your destination kind of thing. Um, the other, going back to the live conversation earlier, they um, there's a company in uh, France that did this in the Netherlands, uh, JP Jaro, I think it is, a pretty famous uh, ad agency. And they did a uh, out of home uh, board, electronic board, uh, like a billboard, but not a, like a driving billboard, but a, a street view billboard. And what they did was they did a live broadcast of the chef around the, of the restaurant around the corner and it was interactive at the sign. So when you walk up to the mm -hmm. sign, the chef actually talked to you and said, hi, how are you? Would you like to order a pizza? It was a pizza place or something. And the guy said, yeah, and he makes the pizza. Around. What do you want on it? Da -da. And he's interacting with the board and says, great, it's gonna be ready in two minutes, go around the corner you know, 50 meters and that's the score to pick it up at. And it was an interactive way of kind of like getting people where they may, they may have walked by the restaurant, they may not have made that turn to go by the restaurant, but it interacted with them at the time. And they're, they're also the same thing. Hey, Mr. D, DeAndre joined us late. Um, not really late, he's still joined. Um, the other was that they're now doing live boards where they're like geofencing the area around the sign and then seeing who demographically is in that area 
And then from there, they're advertising uniquely on that board based on who's in market that can visually see that board, which I think was pretty cool uh, way of interpreting localization for live marketing. How that plays out for hotels, I don't know, restaurants, that could be a very powerful motivator for your sign is at the end of a mall or a shopping area and you can engage people to get them down to your end where they may not have even known you existed or weren't planning on going down there anyway. Uh, might be a way of stretching out your real physical walking location-based interest. Um, yeah. I thought that was pretty neat as a thought. Yeah, I've seen it for some regional, again, in Europe, for some you know, more regional weekend-type destinations where they've put up some boards. And it, you know, it's an easy trip, that sort of thing. It's like, hey, what are you doing this week? And it's live, right? I mean, and people are like, oh, yeah, this is really, you know, really something where you can talk to people. And people wind up, now, again, is that really highly scalable? That sort of thing. It's great for getting attention in PR. And that's right. Thing, it, but, it's unique for but, uh, individual. I mean, we've talked about having the chef do live uh, broadcasting on Periscope or Meerkat for what the dinner specialists have prepared very quickly live so people can see it before and maybe at that point give them a hyperlink over to uh, open table afterwards, you know, right. converting them over to, to the events and stuff. But anyway, we ran through the half hour. Um, geez, that's good. Uh, always. Um, and we'll do this. Uh, we're going to try to keep it at the same time each week. Now we, this time for central and, and Eastern seems to work well. It's at post lunch or at the end of a lunch cycle for both time zones. And, uh, you know, if, it's, if you're in the Pacific Coast time, then you're just before lunch. So I think it all works well. But, um, well, someone will have to fill my seat next week because I'm at the uh, boutique um, lodging conference um, and moderating the CEO yeah. panel, which will be great. You could do it live and you have people join you. You could actually do I could. I could. I, I, I've got to talk to Fran about it. I don't know if I'd like <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. But there's some great CEO. I mean, really great. You know, the, the attendees are great. The... the um, the agenda's great, and it's going to be very interesting because these guys are really, you know, it's not just the, yeah, it's a boutique hotel or developed. These are the guys who are really doing some great cutting edge, you know, cutting edge stuff from a product, you know, product perspective. Oh, we miss you next week. We're trying to figure out the marketing side, which is, that's a lot tougher for them. Yeah. Lauren, for, for the people who joined us late, do you want to recap real quick some of the takeaways or points we discussed during today's lab? Ooh. Well, first off, Robert, you hit yours because you were the first out of the gate with uh, the whole uh, sure. application issue going on. Yeah. Um, Booking.com is now working with TripAdvisor um, on their instant booking platform. So that creates a new dimension um, for hoteliers to consider, um, particularly because if you were only paying a lower commission for 25% of the traffic, uh, booking.com may be in there potentially at a higher commission, um, you know, looking at maybe 75% of your traffic or, or more. I'm not sure exactly what the deals were worked out. So that's an interesting thing for a very good for TripAdvisor that whose stock popped about 22% today. So Wall Street thinks it's a great thing. Um, and then the second one was at Amazon, um, who was kind of testing the, the waters in the, of the hotel and travel space, um, did not like the temperature of the water and got out of the pool. <laughs> uh, the other gaps that we had was we talked about personalization, the need to uh, better identify databasing, uh, that it has transgressed from thinking that we have to have a mobile strategy to actually realize the mobile is the strategy and everything else is secondary to that, that we have to focus first on mobile and personalization of the data that comes from that. Uh, the other we briefly touched on was uh, Google's change in their map app uh now instead of showing seven results localized it's three well highlighted because of additional information uh but that also translates over to the hotel finder side which ironically the featured properties are higher up in the uh, structure of google's assistant booking program uh that got thrown into it um and now i'm drawing a blank what did we paid after that we bounced off of that for a little bit we talked about a lot of from that one so, but yeah, so we talked about some pinterest stuff and yeah. some other etsy you know <laughs> I just want to know how Bethany came in after us for a while, but still got more appreciation than all of us. Uh, it just, it's, and then thanks for Julie for dropping it, dropping it too, and Jay and, and Paolo and everybody for joining. Uh, oh, look at that. Now, now, oh, see, uh, you're, thank you, you shouldn't be asking for appreciation. That's just so, that's just bad form, Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we'll do this again same time next week, which is 1230 Central, 130 Eastern. Uh, 1030, of course, on Pacific time. Uh, again, topics are open because of what's happening that week. Robert, if we can make it, uh, that'd be awesome for you to be there. If not, we completely understand. And uh, we'll catch everyone uh, next week. 
Thanks for <laughs> and, and look at this. We're all an equal appreciation. Oh, no, 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 Bethany. No, Bethany. So, no. As it should be. No, 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 no. Let Bethany win, for God's sake. I'd, I'll, I'll go vote for her. There we go. <laughs> all right, everyone. Thank you all very much. You have a great week.